The Moore Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The Moore Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. The Moore Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. The comments and views expressed on The Moore Show are those of the people that make them and do not necessarily reflect the view of Kevin Moore, The Moore Show, or this radio station and its affiliate or sponsors. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Broadcasting live from the UK and across the world online, you're now listening to the UK's only live alternative late night talk show, and I'm Kevin Moore. For the next three hours, I'll be covering subjects that will open up your mind and provide you with information you may have never heard before. On tonight's show, I'll be joined by filmmaker and director of Three Magic Words, Michael Perlin. Through the film, Michael attempts to reaffirm the old spiritual concept that we are all one, and this oneness is connected to the divinity in all things. We will also discover what these three magic words are, and that's coming up on the second half of the show. To start the show, I'm joined by Micah Hanks, who's a full-time journalist, author, and investigator of The Unexplained. His new book, The UFO Singularities, deal with how today's forecast for future technologies may help shed light on various current UFO technologies. With a thorough analysis of different perspectives on UFO, and how we may improve our understanding, the book will also make predictions about the future of UFO research based on existing trends in technology, which we'll be discussing on the show. Good evening, Micah. Hi there, Kevin. How are you? It's fantastic. I'm, fan I'm fine. Thank you very much. It's fantastic to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us. Well, it's my pleasure, always. And of course, it's, it's not as late for me as it is you and your listeners, but I'm glad nonetheless to be keeping them up at night. Oh. <laughs> well, we've got so much to talk about today, so you're definitely going to keep them up. Um, and it's nice to have such a young face on the screen as well that's dealing with the, the subjects of ufology and mysticism. I, I get that often, you know, and I think that uh, my, my voice kind of uh, is misleading at times because, you know, I host a, a radio show and podcast myself called, called The Graylian Report here in the United States. And uh, when people meet me in public, they say, you know, when I when I heard your voice at first, I imagine, you know, with your southern accent that you'd have a beard and a cowboy hat and cowboy boots, you know, and you'd be in your 40s. And <laughs> I'm a young guy of 30. Uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a uh, you know, a shock to them. But, you know, I've been at it since a very early age, and I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm blessed in that sense to have gotten an early start. Oh, absolutely. I mean, th these subjects are just fascinating. And, uh, you know, I, I understand that uh, your start was due to, is it, is it the Bigfoot? Yeah, you know, that had been something that had always interested me. My, my father, uh, who's actually an Episcopal minister, of all things, he, he has always been fascinated with cryptozoology. And so for me, it was, I think, a natural progression with my own beginnings to take off into that kind of avenue of research. Uh, to me, uh, a creature like Bigfoot, Yeti, the abominable snowman, you know, th this represented something tangible that we could kind of place our hands on, so to speak, uh, unlike UFOs or ghosts, which seem to kind of be a you have to be at the right place at the right moment kind of a phenomenon. But eventually I got into those kinds of things, and I think that uh, today what has really drawn me more toward ufology and the study of perhaps rather than UFOs, what I like to call unexplained aerial phenomenon, which kind of is more all-encompassing in terms of the different uh, approaches and, and things that may entail. I think what drew me to that was the, the concept that we may be dealing with something that literally bends and reshapes fundamentally aspects of human perception and even what we call reality. And so UFOs have become the most challenging of all Fortiana for me, and I think that that's what has kind of held my interest for the last several years, which resulted in this book, The UFO Singularity. Absolutely. And uh, now what I like about you as well is you're sort of interested in the sort of lesser studied facts as well. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, there's so much in the literature that just kind of, uh, you know, people like to rehash a lot of the old reports and things like that. And so I find that uh, if you can find new information or perhaps more importantly, uh, find a new way to approach old information. I think that that may be even more important because especially in the field of ufology, we have gathered an incredible amount. Uh, you know, I would, I would dare say a plethora of information. And yet so often it seems that really how we've treated that for the last several decades is we collect, we categorize, we file it away, and then we forget about it. So what should be done with that information? And so part of what I've also tried to address with the UFO singularity, and of course, you know, with my ongoing writing for sites like Mysterious Universe, Intrepid Magazine, and Graylian Report, my own enterprises, you know, in all these avenues, I try and bring a slightly different approach to looking at existing information and also getting people to kind of think a little differently about what maybe is overlooked in this field. And, you know, I guess with, with what degree of success a 30-year-old guy who's been doing this for about a decade can can have, I've, I've done fairly well. And it certainly, if anything, opened my own mind to possibilities that are often very far removed, Kevin, from what most people would append to the UFO subject. And that conventionally is extraterrestrial or alien visitors from other worlds. I don't necessarily hold to that view. Yeah. I, I acknowledge it as a possibility, but I think that there are a multitude of things that could comprise UFO phenomenon that are so much more often overlooked. And, and is your family quite supportive of, of your work as well? <laughs> you know, they actually are. Yeah, m my mother and my father are both very interested in this. My younger brother, Caleb, actually, he works as a producer on my weekly podcast, The Graylian Report, and he often accompanies me when I go around to events and things around the country. And so I think you're only as good as the people you surround yourself with, and I happen to have some of the very best in my life. Oh, well, that's wonderful. And to be working with your family as well, and, dare I say, making a living from it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, between this and, uh, you know, Performing music on the weekends uh, is is part of my income as well, which actually people kind of think that's an interesting combination, isn't it? You know, you're a you're an acoustic guitarist, jazz and bluegrass musician, and you hunt UFOs. So so how does that come about? But in, in truth, it's not that uh, strange in this field. You know, the the chronicler of all things ufological, Jerome Clark. He had been an editor for Fate magazine. He authored the UFO Encyclopedia. But Jerry had also been a, a very talented uh, country songwriter in his own right and had written a lot of uh, tunes that had been recorded by famous personalities. Uh, I think perhaps Emmy Lou Harris had done one. Okay. Last time I ran into Nick Pope, a, a ufologist that the uh, British audience would certainly recognize. Uh, I saw him in uh, February at the International UFO Congress in Fountain Hills, Arizona, and he had expressed to me how much he and his <laughs> wife apparently love country music now. So it's not really that strange, I think, for ufology and country music to kind of work together hand in hand. <laughs> I'm not the... I feel really good things for you. Do you know that, Micah? I, I really do. I think think you've you've got a a long way to go uh, with, with with your career path, and uh, the world's your oyster. Do you know that? Uh, well, you know, <laughs> I guess we'll see how the, the the road goes and where it takes us. You know, I think I like to look at all of this as is something of a um, you know a progression. I think Bruce Lee, the uh, martial artist, had called it the process of becoming. You know, and I don't think that there's ever a point at which you know, the road ends, where the adventure is over. And I remember the, uh, the the film that came out a few years ago, Harry and the Hendersons, where at the end, the two uh, cryptozoologists that are standing there, based on actual real-life characters, John Green and Rene de Hendon, I believe, is who the, uh, the real-life counterparts for those characters had been. But Jacques, the Frenchman, uh, says, well, there's always Loch Ness, you know, in, in response to the fact that, well, we've solved one mystery. With ufology, it is a uh, an arbitrary and and I think frankly just super weird enough phenomenon yeah. that we may not be dealing with something that we'll be able to put a thumb or a finger on for that matter uh, anytime really soon. I do think, however, though, that within the coming uh, maybe next two decades, to be fairly specific about it. I think we'll be dealing with technologies that will greatly improve our ability, if nothing else, to observe and collect data about UFOs. And so whether or not we can solve the mystery, I think it's especially in ufological terms, we will come to new understandings and perhaps some rather radical ones within the next couple of decades. And that's really the central focus of the UFO singularity is how technology, especially of tomorrow, is going to influence not just our study of the unexplained and, and also the natural world in general, but how literally human perception will be changed just as well oh absolutely as well and um now have you ever had a ufo experience 
you know, I'm so often asked that, and I must be the most boring guy in the world because, you know, I've I've seen a couple of things here and there, uh, you know, unexplained lights in the sky, particularly at one location uh, here in western North Carolina where I reside, and that is uh, a location called the Limville Gorge right there, and it's, it's a beautiful, I think it's, gosh, uh, several thousands of acres of protected wilderness under the 1964 Wilderness Protection Act. Uh, it's best known for a ridgeline called Brown Mountain from which strange you know, glowing and often floating orbs of light appear. And uh, these have been, according to some accounts, they've been seen for centuries. The native Cherokee Indians had claimed to have seen these things. I certainly have seen some strange illuminations there myself. And so whether you want to call those UFOs or not, uh, on at least two occasions I have seen unexplainable lights there over the Limville Gorge. You know, in terms of like a flying saucer or something, I haven't had that experience. But okay. I think maybe that's what drives me yes. is the fact that I want so badly to, to have that experience and to see something. Well, um, watch this space. You you never know, and um, I mean, I mean, you're, you're sort of classed as the the bad guy in a sense, aren't you? In some, some sometimes with your because you you, know, you consider yourself a skeptic, which um, I don't think is a bad thing. I think you know you, you're you're going through the evidence in a logical way, um, but um, just go over that aspect of your work as well as being quite skeptical towards some of the the reported sightings. Well, thank you for asking about that, because I always like to have an opportunity to clear the air. Uh, you know, again, speaking at the uh, International UFO Congress earlier this year, uh, I was billed again as a skeptic, and yet the skeptics didn't like me because I was talking about UFOs. And at what point, if you're going to be quote-unquote skeptical, are you not allowed to endorse the possibility that we may not be alone in the universe? Yeah. I'm not telling you that I have evidence for it or that I personally have ever seen compelling evidence. I also think that evidence and proof are different things. And so when I say that I'm a skeptical researcher, what I specifically mean in the traditional philosophical sense of skepticism is that I, I kind of look at the the data, the facts that we have, and we have accumulated uh, accumulated an awful lot of data over the last several decades, especially since the 1940s, the end of the Second World War, when the UFO era really in modern terms kind of began. There are some compelling instances of unidentified aerial phenomenon that predate the Second World War. But really, I think most researchers would look at it and say this this really became public knowledge around 1947 with Kenneth, Kenneth Arnold. Later, Roswell was exposed, whether or not that was an actual UFO craft. But I say we have to take a look at this evidence of whatever it is, this history of what appears to be something unexplainable that history and present scientific understanding cannot fully account for. And I say we can't make presumptuous guesses and say, okay, well, because we don't know what UFOs are, we're obviously dealing with extraterrestrials. That's what the majority of, I think, uh, researchers even today continue to do. I step back and I say, we can't prove that we're dealing with anything extraterrestrial. But what I think we cannot deny is that UFO phenomenon exists and that government agencies, not just here in the U.S. or in Britain, but all around the world, have taken serious interest in this. The Russian Navy released some of their documents on this a few years ago, said that more than half of their instances of ufological weirdness had taken place underwater, uh, which is actually loosely defined as USO phenomenon. And so there are levels of this phenomenon that even government agencies have you know, not only taken interest in, but have actually gone so far as to make special inquiry into. I think a lot of that is indeed kept from the public uh, in modern times. At one time, it was a little more open with Project Blue Book and the like in the United States. Yeah. But skeptically, again, I'll with, withhold from saying, yeah, we're dealing with extraterrestrials. And instead, Kevin, I'll say that's one possibility. We have to acknowledge that possibility. And now what else could we be dealing with? Because if we overlook the other possibilities, we are very likely to overlook some aspect that will actually help us come to a more full understanding of what UFO phenomenon fully entails. Right, right. I mean, we had uh, Thomas Carey and uh, Donald Schmidt, from the uh, the authors from Witness to Roswell, um, right. on just last week. And, uh, you know, over 650 witnesses, 200, 150 first-hand, 250 second-hand, and the rest were third-hand. Yeah, no, and they're all saying the same thing, that this was not debris from Earth. You know, it's, there's some compelling data uh, that's been released with Roswell. And on the other hand, some of the other researchers, you know, Stanton Friedman has often endorsed that there was something along the lines of an extraterrestrial crash. But Kevin Randall is one who has written extensively about that. He co-authored a book with uh, Schmidt. And I believe that Randall has kind of, over the years, backed away a bit more from the Roswell case. And was, I think that the fundamental question about Roswell would be to ask, okay, why do we have what undeniably are good UFO researchers out there who don't agree about the nature of what exactly happened. Some of them think there was actually a government cover-up, but of something terrestrial. Others think that there was a government cover-up of something that was out of this world in the most literal sense. And I think what that shows is that, and we have to be very careful about this, 
we can even, as good researchers sometimes, interpret data very differently from person to person. And uh, I think that we see this so often in the field. And of course, my juxtaposition against most ufologists and an extraterrestrial component, you know, rather, I, I guess, you know, my, my lack of drawing a conclusion for hope that by being uh, inconclusive in, in my own uh, approaches, I can be a little more objective. You know, I think that, that also illustrates the same thing. Human perception, human interpretation is a big factor in terms of the way we go about studying this phenomenon. And we can't really come to determinations until we acknowledge the fact that most often we are anthropomorphizing what we call UFO phenomenon and expecting that extraterrestrials, whether or not that's what's actually occurring here, are going to behave like us and that we can predict certain aspects of their behavior based on how humans would behave. It's, I think that th those are things that, again, are so often overlooked. And therefore, I think that there's a lot of kind of polarization in the UFO field. And you have good researchers like Schmidt and Randall who have written books together about Roswell in the past, and now they may disagree fundamentally on what actually happened there. Okay. Well, this is a, a fascinating interview. I knew it was going to be. We've got so much to talk about. We're going to take a short break now. But after the break, the phone lines will be open for you to speak to Micah Hanks or share your opinion. You can call us on 0292 000 or text your comments and questions to 07728 758 759. International listeners outside the UK may Skype the show by adding The More Show Live, or you may choose to interact with us on Facebook and Twitter. The More Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. Visit themoreshow.co.uk forward slash shop to purchase products and services from your favourite past guests. If you're new to this site, you can also catch up on the previous television and radio shows through YouTube and the More Show website. The More Show is supported by Mindscape, paranormal and UFO matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. Broadcasting from the studios of Radio Cardiff, you're now watching The More Show. Welcome back to the show. I'm currently joined with my guest, Micah Hanks. Micah, welcome back. Thank you, Kevin. Micah, um, your w book as well, uh, The UFO Singularity, um, you do touch on the, the subject of time travel as well. Is, is that right? Absolutely. And it's been something that's fascinated me for a long time, uh, you know, even outside ufological research. Uh, and as a funny anecdote, I was doing another radio program the other day. Uh, a gentleman called in and claimed he had actually met John Teeter, uh, the famous Internet time traveler from a, uh, oh, maybe wow. a little a decade ago, yeah. So that was very interesting. I couldn't confirm or, or deny that this individual had indeed met a real time traveler, but you know, there's kind of a subculture that surrounds all that. And so, uh, you know, even outside ufological studies, I've always been fascinated not only in actual scientific study of time travel, but maybe some of the more fringe elements as well. So, you know, we, we took a stab at that in the UFO singularity just as well. I mean, what is the possibility that these, you know, UFO craft could be from our future? And why would they be coming back here as well? That's you know those are the million dollar questions you know and and, and the thing is is if anyone answers them they're going to be rich because there's more than one million dollar question. <laughs> but <laughs> what I've found uh, is that uh, UFO phenomenon uh, sometimes is so strange that again maybe the simple ETs visiting from another planet explanation. Uh, is just a little too bland to account for all the uh, the unusual al uh, elements and aspects. And I've often wondered, there was this, the, the report of uh, Dr. X, which uh, Jacques Vallée discussed in his book Confrontations. And uh, this is a well-documented case, and anyone who wants to look, uh, look online you can just search for Dr. X. Uh, it was a pseudonym, obviously, that this individual had used. And uh, without getting into the nitty-gritty because we have time constraints, uh, you know, the, the doctor had late one evening after comforting his uh, crying toddler, he'd gone out onto a balcony and observed two UFO craft. They were classic saucers, and they were hovering parallel to one another. And as he observed them, I think this was during maybe a thunderstorm, he said the two objects began to kind of come together and literally merged as one. Uh, now, I couldn't say that this is absolutely a fourth-dimensional phenomenon that this man was observing in a three-dimensional reality, but it does remind me a bit of the concept, the old idea of flatland. Carl Sagan uh, talked about this concept in his illustrative uh, you know, discussions 
about how a, for instance, one or two dimensional being might perceive a three dimensional being. Uh, and I've often wondered if, for instance, a three dimensional being like you or I were perceiving something from another dimension, or if we wanted to evoke time as being the fourth dimension as some physicists today do, what if that would explain some of the more high strangeness phenomenon that is observed in the UFO literature. And if indeed Dr. X's case, as he was called, uh, can be believed, what if he was observing rather than two actual physical three-dimensional craft coming together as one, what if what he actually observed was a single craft that was intersecting or bisecting, if you will, our dimension from perhaps another, maybe emanating from the future. Another example would be that if, for instance, future Micah walks into the room and sits down here next to me, your viewers would appear to think that they'd seen two of me. Maybe I had a twin. Uh, everyone would, would think that there were actually two Micahs in the room, where in fact, actually there is the one, the three-dimensional present Micah, and then there is the temporally displaced Micah from the future just as well. So I think that if we were to look at things along those lines, maybe if there was an technology or, or something emanating from our future, we could in certain instances perceive that as being two objects in one place at the same time. So that's a simple explanation for how certain aspects of UFO phenomenon might, for instance, be fourth dimensional, non-temporally, you know, or, or as I like to call it, temporally evasive technologies, yeah. which really might be time traveling from our future. And it gets much deeper than that, <laughs> but really you have to read the book to get the complete Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, yeah. So basically, it's not like a you know a time travel device like in the time films. You know, you you you. It's something. Uh uh, that, that's more um, um, well. That's, but you, you wouldn't say that's possible. So you're saying it's not. It's probably not something physical. Well, you know, I mean, it's it's difficult for us to say with certainty what we are or are not dealing with because, as I, you know, and many have, have noticed this, and I think that a lot of the criticism comes when you get into the realm of skeptic uh, or rather uh, speculation. Here I am speculating, and I'm trying to do so skeptically, so I'm a double pariah. But it is largely a speculative discussion since we have not invented time travel, and since we can only, even with the best science of today, speculate as to how time travel might work and whether grandfather paradoxes and space time temporal continuum would be disrupted if we were to actually create a device that would allow time travel. Since we don't know exactly how that would work mm. and what the repercussions would be, we have to be able to get into speculation. But I want to point something else out along those lines. It's funny to me that we have speculative physicists. You know, we have interpretive physicists, people who take physics theory and they apply it to what ifs. And if a person has a PhD or a string of letters after their name, they can do that and it's considered science. Whereas if a person like me sits down and I'm considered, I guess, you know, a ufologist, if anything, uh, if I sit down and do that, people think I'm a crackpot. And yet I'm trying to do essentially the same thing, which I would call reasoned speculation that our physicists today do. And one thing that people who've read the UFO uh, singularity and, and noticed, and I've gotten a good bit of of uh, positive uh, press and, and praise from members of academia who have read it and reviewed the book online. They like the fact that rather than just citing sources in UFO literature, I actually go to scientific journals, you know, and, and go to papers and things like that that are only made available typically through, you know, academic resources and through uh, uh, universities and the like. And I try to actually go and find scientific information that backs up some of the hypotheses that we address. And so particularly a mathematics professor and, and uh, instructor had reviewed the book and had said, you know, that's where this book is a bit different from a lot of ufological studies. It doesn't just draw from case histories in the UFO literature, it looks at actual science and evokes terminology that often is only used outside of the study of UFOs. For instance, the term singularity, which in this context, I literally mean technological singularity, which could be defined very simply as the creation of intelligence or technology that exceeds natural levels of human intelligence. And that could be achieved in a couple of ways, probably artificial intelligence, but we might also utilize technology in the future, such as brain computer interfaces and the like, to enhance levels of human intelligence. And once we get to that point, that's what futurologists of today call the singularity. And I suspect that once we get to that level of yeah. technological perception, you know, that, that augments our own reality in such a way, we may be able to perceive unexplained phenomena vastly differently and even learn new things about it. Oh, I just love the way you explain it. And that's fantastic. And I like the fact that you're very nuts and bolts as well. Um, you so know, and, and you, nuts, Kevin. yeah. Well, you've you've implemented that in your book, and that's why I, I enjoyed doing the research today with your book because I thought, uh, no, this is this is a really good book, and uh, you know, you're going places with this. Um, but uh, you know, uh, going back to the sort of scientific community stance, 
you know, we can't even answer what was there before the universe and, and how incomprehensible it is to be infinity. What is infinity? I mean, you can't get your head around that the universe is endless. So, you know, science doesn't have all the answers. It doesn't. You know, we can only do the best with what we think we know and what we can observe. Uh, you know, science, again, is not a religion. I, in, in my previous book, Magic, Mysticism, and the Molecule, I quoted Robert Jastrow, who had uh, said, I think, as far back as the 1960s, and no doubt he wasn't the first to say this, uh, but he had quoted that there were, was a sort of religion to science. And at some point along the way, many people in academia have seemed to take the approach, not all of them, and I by no means mean to, you know, just defenestrate academia and throw them off a ledge. That's not my intention here. It is to point out that I think that there are a lot of people who just as they will criticize a religious person for being stuck in a modality of thought, many scientists seem to think that rather than being an ongoing expression of our understanding of the universe based on observational data, that science is actually a textbook or a Bible, I guess we could say, and that within the context of that book, all the answers to all things in the universe lay. Now, maybe at some point science will be capable of explaining all things in the universe, but I don't think that the current handbook that we have that we call science has all those answers. And it's a book that is, if you want to call it that, a living document. Uh, science has to be a natural progression, and it has to be constantly growing to account for all the new innovations and also the rewritings of the historic understanding of what we call reality. If we were all still basing everything that we thought we knew on Newtonian physics, we wouldn't know a whole lot, would we? You know, we've had to make room for amendments and and even fundamental breakdowns and, and, and polarization within branches of science. Because in many regards, Newtonian physics actually still holds true and those, yes. you know, observations are very valid. And yet when you get down to the quantum level, a lot of our known physics kind of breaks down which is, in, in essence, the very origin of the term singularity. Werner Vinge, the science fiction writer and mathematician, coined that term, I believe, in an in a article in, uh, I think it was Omni Magazine in 1983, in which he had said that much like the singularity or the event horizon of a black hole, where our physics and what we perceive of reality literally breaks down, beyond the crest of that hill we call technological singularity, our concept of what reality and what humanity even will be in our future breaks down just as well. And so with all the, the positives that I put forth in this book with regard to technological singularity, artificial intelligence, and how it will reshape the way we see the world and possibly UFO phenomenon, I want to make clear also I'm not necessarily endorsing it. Um, this is kind of like looking into the water and just assuming there are no sharks swimming under there. They're going to consume us and eat us alive. We don't know what lays beyond that event horizon that Vinge spoke about decades ago. And frankly, it could be dangerous as well as promising. Well, that's right. I mean, we're sending radio signals to outer space to, you know, to, to, to make contact in these specific programs. But I mean, I'm sure a highly advanced uh, civilization may not be using the, the same technology and it may, it may be a completely different way of communicating. I, I don't know. It seems to me uh, unlikely, and uh, nuclear physicist and UFO researcher Stanton Friedman has long wailed and bemoaned the, uh, the fact that uh, we're utilizing uh, radio cosmology. We've got great big radio transmitters, and we're blasting these things off into space. And yet, why is there no... There are actually some innovations in optics and whatnot used for similar purposes, but those don't seem to have taken the forefront of our... our you know, I guess what we should term is our scientific approach to trying to understand extraterrestrial life. Um, we're utilizing what seems to be a very, very outdated technology, even by Earth standards, uh, with due respect to all the radio listeners out there. I just don't know that, you know, here on Earth we can utilize it, but maybe extraterrestrials aren't going to be as receptive to radio communications. And so I think that that's just an, an issue that a lot of people in the UFO community have had because it seems that whether or not they are right in asserting that UFOs seem to be extraterrestrial intelligence, there have to be more practical, scientific, and innovative ways utilizing what technology is at our disposal to try and learn about other life that may exist elsewhere in the world. But then again, or rather not just the world, but in the universe. Yeah. But we also have to think about what Stephen Hawking and others have said. Well, that's uh, right. Yeah. It could be dangerous to do that. Well, I mean, Stephen Hawking's comments were quite negative at one point towards ufology. I think they, I think they still are. They are. He's, as a matter of fact, he had uh, now someone had said to me that he had been quoting someone else, but I know that Hawking. Um, I've I've seen the speech where no, he it was had his act, quote. It was yeah, yeah. It was. I thought it was yeah, and he had said that you know all ufologists uh, are discounted in this race to understand extraterrestrial life because why would UFOs, if they were ETs, why would they only present themselves to cranks and weirdos? 
well, you know, I've never seen a UFO, but then again, I think a lot of people by virtue of merely expressing interest in this subject would call me a crank or weirdo. And Kevin, I couldn't tell you how many people have told me that because of their experiences with unexplained phenomena that they could not account for, they go to a doctor, discuss what they've seen, and rather than getting support, they're told, have you considered ever taking antipsychotic medication and things like that? So there is a, very, a fairly negative viewpoint that's expressed about this uh, in, in, in much of the academic world today, and that's really a shame because I think that forward thinking uh, sometimes can't exist without there having to be schizophrenia or mental illness just as well. <laughs> well, I know, absolutely, and you know, you know and, and, and talking about sort of the, the negative side of it in a sense, I mean, why are these craft coming all this way just to sort of hover over our defense and nuclear plants? Now, that's a good question. Uh, Robert Hastings, who's the author of a book called UFOs and Nukes, you know, he's a very well-respected uh, researcher, I think, in the UFO communities. Uh, I've spoken with Hastings at least on two occasions myself, and I find him to be someone who is, uh, you know, very, very practical in his approach. Now, he does advocate an ET theory, but what you cannot be denied, whether these are extraterrestrial or something else, I personally hold a slightly different view, which we'll get to here in a moment, but you cannot deny the fact that there, again, are a preponderance of reports that deal with UFOs, unidentified craft, hovering over nuclear facilities, power substations, all different kinds of things like this. And um, I think that it's very interesting when we take into consideration that if these whatever they are, these UFOs are interested in our nuclear test sites, if they have, as Hastings and others have pointed out, literally engaged in the disarmament at times of ballistic nuclear warheads in flight during missile tests and the like, if they're capable of that technology and take such great interest in our nuclear facilities here on Earth, to me that begs the question, could they be much more invested in what's going on right here on terra firma than perhaps an extraterrestrial intelligence would be? If they looked at us and thought we were just barbarians, you know, uh, and they thought that we had a, a realistic potential for mutually assured self-destruction, that we were going to blow each other to smithereens, you know, if I were an ET observing a planet that acted that way, I'd say, let's get as far away from here as we can <laughs> as quickly as possible. <laughs> Maybe that aspect actually re uh, relays something about the UFO phenomenon that, again, is far more closely knit, you know, in terms of earthly happenings. Well, you never know. I mean, are these uh, highly evolved spiritual beings as well? That I mean, are we the artificial intelligence? Are we the aliens? Are, are we are we seeded by them? I mean, you know, these are questions that you know we're never going to get the answers to. I don't think. Yeah, and that's a good question too. And you mentioned artificial intelligence. I, I've often brought up uh, to, to people in discussions about this sort of thing that you know, if we take it to the concept of a Judeo-Christian God. God creates man in his image, and then we assume that the creator has to be omnipotent, you know, and all-powerful, and of course that we're all little underlings under that God, whereas if in the uh, tradition of God made Adam in his image, if we create artificial intelligence, you know, maybe we'll call him rather than Adam, Atom, <laughs> but if we create AI in our image, one of the concerns in this technological age in which we live is that that artificial intelligence may go on to be far greater than us, which brings to mind a bit of scripture, and, uh, interestingly, that, uh, you know, I think it was Christ that said, you'll go on to, you know, do greater miracles than I have done. And I can't help but wonder if, that kind of shows that maybe, whether you want to look at that spiritually, metaphorically, however, interpretive symbology, I think, is, is the way I would, you know, coin it but or, or term it. But what if the creator isn't always beholden, uh, or rather, what if the created is not always beholden to the creator? And what if, in the instance of creation of artificial intelligence, it replicates, it improves upon itself, and it becomes something far greater than what we even are. And what if the actual creators, the operators, or the God, if you want to call it that, that created us in the similar fashion, created us, and we've gone on to do things that that God may never have done? That's not a very easy concept for a lot of people to deal with. And again, you know, as a, as a kind of thought exercise, it's okay. both mind-numbing and disturbing at times. Well, but it, I think it's, it's fascinating. It it's fascinating, Michael, and you're, and you're fascinating as well. So we're just going to take a short break now. Uh, the phone lines are open for you to speak to Mike Hanks or share your opinion. You can call us on 0292 000 3666 or text your comments and questions to 07728 758 759. International listeners outside the UK may Skype the show by adding the more show live or you may choose to interact with us on Facebook and Twitter. The More Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing taking readers beyond the unexplained. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows.
The More Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. Broadcasting from the studios of Radio Cardiff, you're now watching The More Show. Welcome back to the show. I'm still currently joined with my guest, Micah Hanks. Um, Micah, just before the break there as well, I just wanted to touch just briefly again on the um, holographic universe and your work into that. And what, one thing I wanted to say as well is I, I had the pleasure of spending last a day last week with uh, uh, the uh, hypnos hypnograph hypnogress hypnotherapist, shall I get the right word, uh, Dolores Cannon. And... Um, she was telling me about her new book, Book 4, The Convolu Convoluted Universe, and how some of the research that she's done recently in consciousness, uh, people have been describing that. Uh, the, the way that this world is made up is that actually, we, you know, we are in a, a, a sort of computer-generated universe, and that when we see people in the background, they're just backdrop that they're not real i mean it, it completely blew my way of thinking um and i know that david ike talks about this as well but, but what's your sort of opinion on it micah well i think since the uh, the film the the matrix actually a series it was a series of films and of course david ike put out a book uh titled i think something similar children of the matrix so since those films and those kinds of books have come out in recent years it's really kind of turned the world upside down and people have begun to yet again i almost in a cartesian way question uh you know if we think therefore we are are we really uh and and merely by thinking uh, does that constitute reality in other words what we see around us is it real or are we being deceived in some way and are we living some sort of a simulation uh you know in the ufo singularity i get into that and i refer to what i call the operators and the, and the potential i guess that exists and this is something that has been both addressed in scientific literature and studies recently within maybe just the last five years uh, and also philosophy for i guess since uh, men first began to question uh, what it means to think and what it means to be able to reflect back upon and say i rather than just what we perceive in the world you know self-awareness and all these kinds of things i think it's often been evoked the question of is what we see around us real uh, in the scientific sense i was able to uh, during the presentation i gave at the international ufo congress earlier this year which I believe miss cannon was at as well uh, gave a fantastic lecture there as well uh, but during my presentation i uh, actually uh, cited two studies one of them by james sylvester gates jr which looks at the possibility that there are essentially what he would call computer codes that can be derived from supersymmetry and from string theory uh, as expressed utilizing complex uh, uh, mathematics. And so I think that the question that is derived from studies like this is that do we actually, or are we, at very least are we beginning to find evidence of what we would call a simulated reality? Are aspects of what we can now observe about the universe through multidimensional theory, uh, you know, multiverse, string theory, these sorts of things, when we express that mathematically, are we beginning to find the very beginnings of evidence that there is an aspect of reality that we might liken to being a computer program? And does that imply that what we think we see around us and what we understand as being reality may actually not be as real as we think it is? It's, it's a stri very strange concept, but I think it's becoming more and more likely every day. I mean, have you ever sort of asked yourself that question, if I strip back my title, if I strip back everything that, that I own and come down to a point of who am I, then, you know, are we more than our bodies? And, you know, then, then this sort of, you know, <laughs> trips into the question of, of the holographic universe. But I mean, have you ever asked yourself that? Am, am I more than me? Oh, yeah, every day. Uh, you know, and I, I think that uh, it becomes troubling to an extent because what this requires when you think about that. I mean, people can stare at themselves in the mirror and say, who is that? Uh, people can can ask themselves while lying in bed in the middle of the night. I, I tend to wake up in the middle of the night quite often, and it may have to, more to do with the coffee I drink. <laughs> <laughs> Researcher, but uh, but I, I'll awake in, in the middle of the night and ask those kinds of questions, and I know that uh, that requires a lot of abstract thinking to really truly philosophically ponder uh, that as a potential, as not just you know, a, well, okay, that's an idea. I mean, to really delve into the idea of what if that is really what we're experiencing? What if the flesh and blood that I think I know? What if my interactions with people every day? is representative of literally what we would see in the Matrix films. Uh, what if there is some sort of a, a complex algorithm that, for all we know, emanates from our future, and our actual descendants are controlling aspects of what we perceive as the past? That would answer a lot of questions with regard to UFOs, to my mind, but it also causes a lot of problems, and it reminds me of the film A Beautiful Mind, 
Oh, yes. And which actor, Russell Crowe, uh, he portrays John Nash. John Nash was a brilliant thinker, and I think that he was perhaps evidence that a lot of people who really are able to think so far outside the box may at times begin to have trouble with that. Now, there could be other chemical reasons for the onset of mental illness just as well. Fortunately, I don't know myself to be an, a mentally ill individual yet, and I hope to prevent that at all costs. But I think that it really does push us to the very boundaries of insanity sometimes asking those kind of questions. And nonetheless, I do it every day just for fun. <laughs> Same here. Don't worry. You're not on your own. <laughs> I mean, okay. do, doing, doing these kind of subjects, it does completely make you think outside the box. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy with that, you know, but I'm also happy to sort of um, balance it as well. There's got to be a balance because I'm here right now. That's all I know. Um, but if I can improve my life and, and those around me by asking those questions, then it's got to be worth it. Well, it looks like you're doing a very good job thus far, Kevin. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, well, it's 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 never an easy path, is it, doing this kind of show, as you as you know, um, it's never oh, a straight path. Yeah, it's, you know, usually people who get into this and and they're dealing with ufology or anything strange phenomenon, you know, of any kind, uh, they're typically the ones that are trying to. I guess, prove themselves, if you will, or at least remain afloat amidst a mainstream world whose views are far more conservative. Now, in my case, I find that uh, amidst my own peers in this field, I'm often, uh, we don't quarrel, but I, I do find that people will say, Micah Hanks is the problem with ufology today. This, He's the person who is taking us away from what we've spent the last several decades trying to determine. And if he was educated enough in the UFO literature, he would already understand that he's wasting his time trying to divert people's view away from the extraterrestrial reality, whereas, quite the contrary, Kevin, I feel that by immersing myself in that literature, uh, I don't think that all observed phenomenon, all the data sets that we can derive from Project Blue Book and from you know the research of those like J. Allen Hynek, who did a very important job of taking scientific training and, and, and using that in his interpretation of those Blue Book reports, and then people who came after him, Brad Steiger, John Keel, and of course, probably my, my principal influence, Jacques Vallée and a few others. You know, you have to be able to look at this information and say, does what we have in terms of actual scientific data, and I think there's a lot of that in relation to UFOs, does that represent what we would expect from an extraterrestrial intelligence? Or are we basing those expectations again on our own values? And does it call for a reevaluation based on a non-typical approach? In other words, removing human interpretation from the, from the uh, phenomenon as much as we possibly can, being humans, of course, and trying to step away and say, okay, maybe the arbitrary aspects, maybe the insanity that comprises so much of the UFO enigma, maybe this is something that uh, actually does make sense, just not earthly sense. And maybe not all aspects of the phenomenon could be quantified so simply as being physical, flesh and blood entities like you or I, that for whatever reason have taken interest in the happenings on this little mud ball we call Earth. I just don't think that all the data points in that direction. Some of it certainly could, but it's far more complex than that. Okay, okay. I mean, wh where would you like your work to go as well? Because obviously this book's very much orientated towards uh, uf ufology and, um, you know, artificial intelligence and so many other great subjects as well. Um, but but what, what's the sort of next sort of progression for yourself? Well, you know, I've taken a serious interest in, uh, it, I guess you would call synthetic telepathy and, and the like, and this would utilize, uh, this would, uh, I guess, entail more uh, accurately the utilization of uh, what we would probably call singularity or post-singularity technologies to enable what we have a term for today, but yet which science cannot account for. Um, you know, as, as a matter of fact, I think there are already uh, defense budgets and 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 well, uh, you know, known individuals who have actually gone on the record and said that there are uh, defense contractors and agencies and things that are looking into military applications for what we'd call synthetic telepathy. So that's something that's interesting to me. That is also somewhat in line with the idea of how singularity relates to unexplained phenomenon. Uh, and then, of course, you know, there are the other aspects just as well. I, 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 you mentioned at the beginning that uh, I kind of got my start doing cryptozoology. And I haven't given up uh, on my interest in, in strange beings and, and the more apparently physical phenomenon that still occurs, although I, again, take a very different approach to all that. And it's uh, more of a sociological kind of component to me these days. So in the future, people can look for a report on anomalous missile sightings as they relate to UFOs and People know probably about ghost rockets from the 1940s. Oh, yes. I'll say this. That phenomenon is far from isolated to the 1940s. It's continued, and in fact, I think there's good evidence that I've uncovered that UFO missiles uh, are still seen today. In some instances, they may have been deadly. 
Um, of course, there's also the uh, the sociological study of cryptozoology, and then finally, folks will be able to, uh, by, hopefully by year's end, find a new book about this brown mountain light phenomenon that I've been talking about just as well. And so, and then finally, of course, if people want to find out about all that and hear me talk about it in person, you know, there is an event I put on called the Paradigm Symposium each year in Minneapolis, Minnesota, that uh, kind of deals with all this kind of subject matter. You know, I, I like to try and, as much as possible, Kevin, uh, get people talking about this sort of phenomenon, this sort of research, because I think that's the best way to move forward. And so if anything, uh, if and if nothing else, in the future, I hope just to be able to continue to be able to facilitate conversation and discussion and serious inquiry into this phenomenon. Well, you do a good job at that. Trust me, you do. And um, oh, there's, there's a few things here that, that we're not going to get through. Um, we, we did have a, a couple of texts, and one of them was, um, uh, you know, ask Micro about the men in black. So I've asked you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could say very simply, uh, I've had uh, something of an MIB experience myself. Uh, you know, one of my, actually one or two, uh, one of the better ones was a reader uh, had uh, contacted me a few years ago and told me that they had been told not to communicate with me, Micah Hanks, any further because an MIB had told them as such. Um, and I also, speaking of which, uh, authored an essay on The Men in Black that will be in Nick Redfern's upcoming book on that subject, which is actually a sequel to his previous book, The Real Men in Black. Uh, he, he very graciously uh, contacted me and asked if I would make a contribution to that book. And of course, uh, Nick and I have worked very closely. He'll be a speaker at the Paradigm Symposium this October in Minneapolis. And uh, who knows, there may even be, and I'll go ahead and on the record say that there have been some official discussions about a co-authored project between Nick and I. So maybe that'll come together in the next few years. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. And um, yeah, in your work as well, uh, you, you pretty much keep the abduction and uh, the, the ufology as a sort of separate issue, don't you? I certainly do. But uh, I'll say this, uh, and I won't name uh, the individual's name right yet, although I don't think you would mind me naming him uh, publicly, but I'll just leave it at this for now. Um, I did about a three-hour session right here in my studio yesterday with a gentleman from across the United States uh, who happened to be in the area. He's a fellow researcher and also uh, an individual who believes he has been abducted multiple times in his life and shared some very, very compelling stories with me about his ongoing interactions with whether or not you call it extraterrestrial. Again, some sort of intelligence. Um, and it's funny because that experience kind of reminded me, it was a refresher for a lot of interviews I'd done with people in the past who had come to me and because of my interest in UFOs said, you know, I've had also this other experience and I'd like to share that with you. All down the road, I can't discount the idea that I would look at abduction phenomenon more uh, fully. But again, from that same perspective that I often tend to take, which is about two steps back, let's take this and let's not say UFO abduction or anything else. Let's say there are people who claim that they have an interaction with some form of intelligence. Some aspects of this overlap with UFO phenomenon. And then again, there are also folk folkloric parallels to, you know, the fairy folklore of the British Isles and things like that. So, uh, you know, again, I don't call it UFO abduction, but I will not state that there is not some kind of phenomenon, whether that be something that's physical in some instances, quasi-physical, uh, or maybe even just outright psychological that's occurring. I don't know, and I'm not an abductee. I haven't had that experience, but I am fascinated with people who say that they have. Absolutely. Um, well, I mean, I, I did want to touch on this interview just briefly as well about uh, have, you, have you done much research into ancient history or, or sort of evidence of, uh, you know, uh, places like Atlantis or other such sort of historic uh, um, um, continents, perhaps? Uh, you know, I have, actually. Uh, although it's not my central focus, really, there's very little that I, <laughs> I don't at least take interest in, and I'm, I'm fascinated with it. And I often tell people that, uh, you know, when I was about 17 years old, my father asked me to come upstairs after dinner. He threw literally a dossier on the bed and said, take a look at that. And so I opened it up, and it was all about Rensselaer Chateau, uh, you know, and, and and the I guess what really Dan Brown is popularized today with his books like The Da Vinci Code. And so uh, my relationship with my father is very much like what we see in the third Indiana Jones film where Sean Connery portrays Henry Jones Sr. That's my dad. I'm Indiana Jones. <laughs> now, that's, of course, very idealistic. But, I mean, it really was like that as a kid. And my father and I, even today, hope soon to travel to Georgia to look at what appear to be uh, sites that may be indicative of pre-Columbian uh, visitation to the United States. Um, and it's just fascinating stuff. And I think that truly that's kind of where the focus of this year's Paradigm Symposium 
has gone. You know, some of the speakers that we have are Robert Laval. We've got Robert Schock. Uh, we've also got a, a popular television personality, Scott Walter, of a program called America Unearthed here in the U.S. All of these kinds of guys are going to be some of our key speakers at this year's event. And the reason for that is because I think that there is such an incredible interest amongst people today in ancient mysteries of the past. And last year, one of our best speakers was Philip Coppins, the late and very great researcher. Uh, I actually authored uh, Philip's, uh, I guess you'd say his obituary, you yes. know, kind of a, a m memoriam to him, uh, which was featured in Our Intrepid magazine, which is also a sponsor of Paradigm Symposium. Philip was such a good researcher. His interpretation of Atlantis was completely different from most. He believed that it was uh, folklore surrounding an ancient I guess, megalithic site in part of Europe rather than out there someplace in the ocean. So there are great mysteries about this world. Many of them predate known and, and recorded history, and I'm just as fascinated by all those as well. Well, I mean, there is evidence of sort of nuclear events in ancient times, is there not? I authored an essay on that, actually, yes, for a, a compilation that New Page Books published about two years ago. Uh, and uh, certainly I've been interested in what undeniably are evidence of, or evidences of, in numerous instances actually, nuclear events that occurred in ancient times. I think maybe around 12,000 years ago was one of the more recent anomalous nuclear events that occurred. Um, some have suggested, and I think even maybe Robert J. Oppenheimer, or J. Robert Oppenheimer rather, who had been involved with the Manhattan Project, uh, he, I think he may have been of the belief that there could have been worlds before our own. And when I say worlds, perhaps intelligent civilization here on Earth that existed thousands and thousands of years ago. Um, when the Trinity blast the first test blast of a nuclear device took place over Alamogordo during the Second World War. Oppenheimer was said to have cited the Bhagavad Gita and said, now I am become death destroyer of worlds. And of course, the ancient Edian, uh, Indian, the, the Vedic uh, texts, the holy epics of the Hindu religion, they often discuss an ancient battle that took place. And so whether that's merely folklore or as some literally interpret it to mean that there was an yeah. ancient battle that involved what we would maybe call Star Wars technologies, I, you know, I couldn't tell you that that's actually what happened, sure. but question, there is evidence of nuclear events that were probably a, a variety of natural phenomenon more likely that occurred in ancient times, probably okay. shortly after the last ice age. And your website, Micah? Yeah, if folks want to learn more about me, it's www.graylianreport.com. That's G-R-A-L-I-E-N, report.com. And info at graylianreport.com is the email. They can contact me directly through that site. Well, Micah, thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to link your book and website up as well to this, uh, to this uh, interview. And, uh, you know, feel free to come on again, please. I, I hope you'll have me back. And, uh, Kevin, I'll sincerely look forward to that. There's going to be a lot of books to come, so let's do it again soon, okay? Excellent. Thank you so much. Stay tuned as after the break we'll discover what these three magic words are with Michael Perlin, director-producer. Stay tuned. Visit themoreshow.co.uk forward slash shop to purchase products and services from your favourite past guests. If you're new to this site, you can also catch up on the previous television and radio shows through YouTube and The More Show website.